tapped on all available information. Are these crop circles related to flying saucers? How could anything do that without it didn't come out of the sky? Have humans been in contact with extraterrestrials? The creatures were laying like this. Are aliens abducting human beings for scientific research? I kept questioning, like, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And everything would come back would be like, your scientists do this. Is our government telling us all the truth about UFOs? Our government has flat out lied to us for 40 years or more. There are thousands of people around the world who claim to have seen them. Skeptics suggest it's all a hoax. Yet there is a growing number of people who have no doubt UFOs exist. Hello, I'm Tim White. I'll be your host as we explore what people around the world now believe about UFOs. Flying saucers, creatures from another planet, unidentified flying objects. In the next hour, we'll hear from people who have had close encounters with extraterrestrials. Close encounters of the first, second, third, even the fourth kind. The most common is a close encounter of the first kind, which is defined as the sighting of an unidentified flying object, an object that can't be explained by conventional means. It was just a red flash of light. It, it I sounded really like a, uh, well, a swishing sound, sort of. Et alors autour de cette forme, il y avait des petites lucioles rouges. I saw this big triangular shaped three lights on each corner coming over my house. Mysterious lights in the sky. They were like stars. No sound. Uh -huh. It just like was sliding through the sky and it mm -hmm. tilted like it was looking down at us. It was a bright light that dimmed down to a white speck and went back to a red light down to a white speck and then just disappeared. Last year, there were almost 4,000 reported UFO sightings in the United States, 2,000 in South America, more than 1,000 in Asia, and over 3,000 in the Soviet Union. The worldwide total was over 10,000. UFO investigators wonder why those numbers have increased dramatically in the past 45 years. There's the publicity of one person seeing a UFO spark the imagination of others who are eager to believe? Or has the Air Force simply increased its testing of military hardware? These are difficult questions to answer without tracing the UFO story. Let's start at the beginning. Cave art in Australia and the Western United States, painted at least 5,000 years ago by prehistoric civilizations, seems to resemble modern descriptions of creatures from outer space. Halfway around the world, a 13th century fresco inside a church in Yugoslavia includes a flying vehicle. It would be another 700 years before technology made flight possible. The modern age of UFOs began in 1947. Ex-military pilot Kenneth Arnold was flying his plane over the Cascade mountain range. He encountered several objects traveling at an extreme rate of speed. Although there are no photographs, Arnold had a drawing made of what he saw. His sighting triggered hundreds more that year across the United States. UFO mania reached a fever pitch in the summer of that year when the Army Air Force reported recovering a crashed saucer in New Mexico. The next day, the government claimed the disc was only the wreckage of a weather balloon. Meanwhile, sightings by credible witnesses continued. Commercial airline pilots saw things. We immediately decided it could not be a comet. Military pilots saw things. When we got within two miles of the light, we lost all contact. Local sheriffs in Dexter, Michigan, saw things. Well, there was somewhat of an oval shape, looked like a toy top. Sightings of unexplained phenomena weren't limited to just the United States. Marina Popovich, a Soviet pilot with over 100 airspeed and endurance records to her credit, had her first UFO encounter in the mountains of southern Russia. My first contact with a UFO was a rather special experience. It was in the mountains, and I saw a sharp ray coming out of a huge sparkling ball. Even some of the men and women who have been in space have reported seeing things they can't explain. Gemini and Apollo astronaut James McDivitt had his own encounter in June of 1966. While in orbit above the Earth, 
an unidentified object outside the window caught his attention. I happened to glance out one time, and there against the black sky was a, was a white object. The uh, geometry of it was sort of like a, a beer can or a Coke can with a, with a pencil sticking out the, one of the round edges at about a 45-degree angle. What was it? McDivitt was able to snap a few pictures, but after turning the film over to NASA, the photographs disappeared. He suggests it's conceivable that other civilizations could have the technological know-how to make space travel possible. And he's not alone in this belief. A 1990 Gallup poll showed that nearly 50% of Americans believe in the existence of UFOs, despite the fact that most photographs and film footage of the actual sightings are not very good. The images are scratched, out of focus, or the camera's just too far away to see things clearly. But with the advent of the home video camera, more and more people have captured unexplained phenomena on tape. This home video was shot over Las Vegas in early 1991. It shows three objects floating and diving in front of the mountains. This is a spectacular maneuver. As you say, it goes in front of the mountains, so it has the mountains as a backdrop, which gives you a fairly good idea of its distance. In Gulf Breeze, Florida, something that looks like a spacecraft was caught floating just above the tree line. Videos like this have convinced quite a few Gulf Breeze residents that UFOs are real. A small town located just across the bridge from Pensacola. It's been one of the busiest places in the United States for UFO sightings since 1987. And we have over 500 witnesses and we have about 262 recorded sightings and we've investigated um, almost 200 of those. The investigations have been conducted by a small group of Gulf Breeze residents. Most are members of MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, a grassroots national organization of private citizens who've taken it upon themselves to try to get to the bottom of the UFO mystery. One possible explanation has surfaced. Gulf Breeze is virtually surrounded by three major military bases, all with extensive air traffic. We call the military. We're told, no, we did not have anything in the area uh, at the time that, that you had your sighting. Uh, of course, there will be those that say, well, that's the typical military response. Even if there was something going on, they would deny it. The wave of sightings in Gulf Breeze started with this man, Ed Walters. In November of 1987, Ed and his wife Frances took some amazing photographs of a flying saucer. Fearing ridicule, at first Ed kept the pictures to himself, but then he sent them to the Gulf Breeze Sentinel, the local newspaper. Publisher Duane Cook knew his reputation would be on the line if he decided to print the pictures. I was nervous, naturally, and my folks came in Wednesday afternoon while we were putting the paper together. And uh, I said, you're not going to believe what we're getting ready to run in this week's paper. Showed them the pictures, and they looked at them and said, that's what we saw. So at that point, I more or less lost my fear of going with it because, you know, if your own folks see it, uh, if you can't trust them, who can you trust? As it turns out, at least a dozen other people saw the same thing that night, including Art Hufford and several other people who then became members of MUFON. I never felt more alone than I felt that day, November the 11th, 1987, seeing this thing, and then later, uh, nobody saying very much, and then, of course, several weeks later, you know, people were coming forward, and fortunately, you came forward a month later and said, hey, uh, I saw that same thing. Dr. Bruce McAbee, an expert photo analyst employed by the Navy with over 20 years' experience, spent several months studying the Walters pictures. McAbee also had Walters use a stereo Polaroid camera the next time he saw something. Some of his early photos contemplated the possibility that they were hoaxed by a double exposure method. But there is a question of whether or not anybody knows how to, photo, how to fake stereo pictures and do it well. I concluded that uh, doing the photography, if it was a hoax, combined with all the other sightings, uh, the testimony of Ed and his family, the intensive investigation, all ruled out the possibility that this was a hoax. And so I concluded in late May of 1988 that it was real. Since 1987, South Shoreline Park has become a magnet for sky watching. The sky watchers have been able to videotape several unidentified objects. Most of them look like nothing more than small points of light in the sky, 
But close examination has revealed that the lights are doing something that science says is impossible. They move at odd angles, change size, travel at unheard of speeds, all while never making a sound. One of the more recent videos uh, shows a light that was red and all of a sudden it turns white and starts flashing. These extremely brilliant pulses of light. It appears that the actual, it's as if the actual size of the image and which would be related to the size of the light source itself, changed in uh, like one thirtieth of a second or so from one TV frame to the next. Uh, we don't have anything that could do that so far as I know. While the encounters continue in Florida, the most recent UFO observations have occurred thousands of miles away in Belgium. An amateur photographer videotaped this triangular shaped object in early 1991. Last year, there were 500 sightings in all of Europe. So far this year, reports in Belgium alone have totaled over 3,500. From prehistoric cave art to medieval frescoes to videotapes in Florida and Belgium, people have been recording strange things they've seen in the skies. What are they? Perhaps the answer lies out beyond the stars. At this point, just out of our reach. In July of 1991, astronomers reported the discovery of a planet 10 times the size of Earth orbiting a star 30,000 light years away. If the finding is confirmed, it will be the first planet detected outside our solar system. Could it be possible we're not the only living beings in the universe? And while we're watching the skies, we wonder if someone might be watching us. When we return, close encounters of the second kind. Some UFO researchers claim that extraterrestrials have left behind traces of physical evidence. Why would it be exactly 46 and a half? No matter how you measure it, it's 46. Second kind are encounters that leave behind some form of physical evidence. Two types are most often reported. First, the bodies of cattle, horses, and occasionally wild animals mutilated by some sort of high-tech equipment. Second are crop circles, enormous elaborate designs that appear overnight stamped into the fields as if by some heavenly artist. To my amazement, there was a huge circle in an RC rape field up there. I nearly crashed the car because I was so excited. The crop circle phenomenon began in the mid-1970s. English farmers started finding giant circles in their fields pressed into their crops with the precision of a cookie cutter. Many thought it must all be some kind of hoax, or perhaps funny weather. It was strange, though. There were never any unusual tracks leading out to the circles, and no reports of odd weather. Baffled scientists flocked to circle locations, hoping to find a reasonable explanation for the phenomenon. But one by one, theories blaming disease, helicopters, tornadoes, and hoax artists were shot down. I've come across many hoaxes, and you can tell them within two minutes because the normal circles, the corners, just simply gently move down and the stalks are not broken. Anybody that tries to reproduce a hoax circle by chain, trampling, any way you may think will damage the structure of the crop involved. What does it all mean? Well, this is one case where your guess is probably as good as any. There are as yet no prevailing theories on how the circles are being formed. Remember, we are stepping into the unknown. Banded together into an organization for scientific examination of the circles, British researchers are baffled at the fact the bent over crops keep growing and show no signs of any physical contact. They say their evidence does indicate the circles are formed in about five to 10 seconds and are caused by some tugging force, though the roots are not pulled from the soil. And the circles aren't confined only to Britain. Japan is one of the many places crop circles have shown up in the last few years, along with Canada and here in the United States, throughout the Midwest, in towns like Milan, Illinois. I thought to myself, how could anything do that without it didn't come out of the sky and come down here? Now they almost come down and do this because there's no way it could get in here. No alien droppings whatsoever, no. It might be a tornado or some kind of a wind, but it's, why would it be exactly 46 and a half? No matter how you measure it, it's 46 and a half. During the last few years, while the rest of the world got used to the appearance of crop circles, British farmers found their encounters changing. Now, they weren't just circles anymore.
the most amazing thing was that in 1990, in May, we started getting these pictograms, which are these dumbbell or barbell shaped uh, formations with various features coming out of them. Features like hands and claws, uh, semicircles on the end, all of these things. We've never seen anything like that before. The British hoaxsters who recently claimed credit for the crop circles could demonstrate only the crudest designs, and the quality and quantity of their handiwork left most experts unconvinced. When you go into the extra pieces that were there, the claw features, key pattern, that sort of thing, we found they were still as precise, and the floor patterns were very, very uh, precise. It is impossible to reproduce an entire structure like that, which is nearly 300 feet in length, without creating an immense amount of damage in its construction. Despite attempts by a wide range of experts, no one has been able to photograph a circle being made. But strange sounds have often been recorded lingering within the circle area, sounds that can best be described as a trilling noise. And researchers do get plenty of reports of strange sightings. We've got, oh, at least, at least 20 or more cases of uh, circles which have formed following the following UFO activity or following globes of light which have descended into the field or lights which have uh, shone beams down into the field. Clearly they uh, seem to be related to electromagnetism, there's overwhelming evidence of that, but how electromagnetic forces can produce this effect we don't know. What I think is becoming very clear now is that we are forced to conclude that because these patterns are very symmetrical and very beautiful that they are designs. They are designs and therefore there's a designer. And therefore there's an intelligence of some sort behind the design. Um, this is the, f the fifth cattle uh, steer that's been mutilated uh, since uh, mid-spring of this year. North American livestock farmers are also dealing with a strange phenomenon that's been classified as a close encounter of the second kind. Although this one is as repulsive as the crop circles are beautiful. Since the mid-60s, some ranchers in the American and Canadian West have been finding dead animals in their fields. Investigators have dismissed predators as a probable cause because there are rarely any tracks around the body, not even the tracks of the animal itself. The carcasses are usually neatly cut open, organs removed with surgical precision, and as Joel Bradshaw discovered on his ranch in Arkansas, the aftermath is an oddly bloodless scene. The blood had been taken away. There was no blood, no word. You could take a piece of white piece of cloth and leg in it and you didn't get no blood or nothing. Some have said cult followers are to blame, but medical evidence makes that unlikely. Tissue samples sent to Oregon State University for testing showed that high heat had been used to make the strange rippled incisions, heat like that of a medical laser. So maybe it's the work of high-tech cultists. Well, medical lasers didn't even exist when this phenomenon began. And even today's so-called portable lasers require a generator the size of a large freezer. Many farmers say they don't need medical evidence. They know their fields very well. And animals and humans would leave evidence behind. Human beings will always make mistakes along that line. They'll forget something or drop something, or but there's no sign you can go off 50 yards around it and never find any. As with crop circles, UFO sightings often seem to precede the mutilations. There have been possibly 15,000 of these cases uh, in the United States and Canada since the 60s. And, you know, you look at the records, you look at if there's, if there's anybody been prosecuted, has anybody been arrested, and you don't find that. You don't find any prosecutions, you don't find any arrests. In a forensic sense, you use all the information, you look at all of it. And when you get all of that information and you run it through a sieve, you come out that, that there is some other non-human entity doing this. So who or what is plucking animals from their fields only to return them later, dead and missing some of their organs? Journalist and documentary filmmaker Linda Moulton Howe, who helped bring the mystery to light with her book, An Alien Harvest, has a theory. The mutilations are part of some incredible extraterrestrial genetic research that is linked to the phenomenon of human abductions. What's unknown is, is the genetic experiment to make something from our DNA, the cattle DNA, other animal DNA, 
and take it away somewhere? Or is it to make something that is going to cohabit with us on this planet? Or some reason that is impossible for us to even imagine? Whether it's animal mutilations or crop circles, both close encounters raise interesting questions about what they mean. Could they be part of some extraordinary plan? One theory suggests that if the pictograms are formed by extraterrestrials, they may be a non-threatening way for preparing the human race for eventual open contact. I think there is a symbolism embodied in the circles which is uh, highly relevant and something which we probably can't all understand at a at an intellectual level, but possibly we understand it at a subconscious level. I think there's great significance attached, though. I think um, that the circles will probably change all of us. Coming up, this man claims to have had a close encounter of the third kind, the sighting of an alien being. My Uncle Ted was standing more over here, kind of leaned over like this, and we're talking to this creature. Beyond spacecraft sightings and physical evidence is another category of close encounter, the third kind, interaction with alien beings. The most thoroughly documented incident in UFO history led to an encounter of this kind. It occurred on a desolate stretch of New Mexico desert in 1947. That year, hundreds of UFOs were reported across the West. UFO researchers theorized that Perhaps because the army was testing nuclear weapons, aliens were interested in how advanced our technology had become. And on July the 2nd, one of those hundreds of flying objects supposedly crashed, setting the stage for a close encounter of the third kind. Roswell, New Mexico. It's as quiet and peaceful today as it has been for decades. But on July 8th, 1947, that tranquility was shattered by a local newspaper headline. Air Force captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region. The story described wreckage of a flying disc found near a place called Corona and was based on a press release written by the public information officer at Roswell Air Base, Lieutenant Walter Hoff. This building here, uh, building number 84, is a building I believe that they brought materials from the corona crash and stored them in here temporarily. The chief intelligence officer at the base, Major Jesse Marcel Sr., was sent out to the ranch to collect the crash debris and transport it to the Army Air Force headquarters for examination. In the meantime, newspapers all over the western United States picked up the story. But before Marcel had landed his plane and strange cargo, the Air Force issued a second bulletin. By the time the B-29 with Jesse Marcel and some of the wreckage got to the headquarters two hours after they left in Fort Worth, Texas, the fix was already in to kill the story. The second press release was far different from the first, saying the wreckage was actually from a weather balloon. Could the Army's top intelligence investigators have committed such a basic blunder, failing to recognize the mundane remains of a weather balloon when they first encountered it? No, says nuclear physicist and part-time UFO researcher Stanton Friedman, who's been investigating the Roswell crash for over a decade. He says that while Marcel was in the air, the Roswell base commander, Brigadier General Roger Rainey, got orders from Washington to cover up the incident. And what he did? was arranged for the wreckage of a weather balloon, the radar reflector on a weather balloon. And for a while, the saucer saga was forgotten, and might have remained so if Major Marcel hadn't rekindled the fire in 1980. Just before he died, Marcel admitted that the weather balloon story had been fabricated to hide the truth. He told Walter Hutt there really was a saucer crash. He made statements to the effect that it was nothing of this world. It couldn't be bent, torn, cut, uh, pierced, <laughs> burned. Uh, he went through a whole list of them. He said, we just don't have the technology to produce material like I brought in from that ranch. The government steadfastly maintains that there never was a crash near Roswell. But Friedman contends his research shows there was not just one, but two UFO crashes that day, the result of a spectacular mid-air collision. Which brings us to our close encounter of the third kind. Freeman says wreckage of the second craft landed some 200 miles away from the first. And this time, 
that were survivors. When I first came up to the, the craft, the creatures were laying like this in a line, side by side. And the live one was, was over here. Gerald Anderson says he was five years old when he and his family came across the unearthly wreckage and bodies. And my dad was kind of oh, right about here, and he was sitting like this. My Uncle Ted was standing more over here, kind of leaned over like this, and they were talking to this creature. Anderson's story matches that of others who were in the area at the time. The With the help of hypnotherapy, here. He's been able to remember the encounter with startling detail. His description matches those from people who claim to have seen aliens. Four feet tall, grayish skin, large eyes, long skinny arms and fingers. Anderson recalls two aliens were dead, a third dying, and a fourth alien survivor seemed to be trying to communicate. And just suddenly he turned and he looked at me. And when that happened, all kinds of things just started happening inside my head. I, I, I started getting sensations of tumbling and falling and an awful loneliness, like there was no way he could possibly get back to where he came from. Anderson says that within a matter of minutes, the military arrived, sealing off the area. The civilians at the site were threatened with bodily harm if they talked. Nevertheless, in the past 20 years, hundreds of witnesses have come forward, some daring to speak only on their deathbeds. Out in the New Mexico desert, there's no longer any trace of alien craft. And Stanton Friedman says the story can't be covered up forever. There were simply too many witnesses. We have testimony from over 200 people concerned with these events, people who handled the wreckage, people who described the bodies, people who were, had direct orders, military orders, to do this, that, or the other thing. We have consistent testimony that in a court of law would convict anybody of a crime. Even with the overwhelming amount of testimony, the government has refused to acknowledge that either crash ever happened. None of the debris has surfaced, neither have any official documents, and most of the first-hand witnesses have died. As for the captured alien, the most often told story suggests that he lived for a few years at a military installation and then died of an unexplained illness in the early 50s. When we return, close encounters of the fourth kind, people who claim to have been abducted once the beam of light hit me, I was paralyzed. The theories expressed are not the only possible interpretation. The viewer is invited to make a judgment based on all available information. Close encounters of the fourth kind are by far the most frightening. Abductions of human beings by aliens. According to those who claim to have been abducted, they're transported by a beam of light aboard a spacecraft, set up on an examination table, surrounded by strange creatures, probed and prodded as tissue and fluid samples are taken, and then returned to the point from which they were abducted, most often with little or no recollection of what happened. The one thing they know for certain is that minutes, even hours, have passed that they can't account for. This form of amnesia is known as missing time. This missing time aspect is very, very common in abduction experiences where uh, the person cannot remember where he or she was. Bud Hopkins, best-selling author and UFO abduction investigator. It was early, fairly early, about nine in the morning when I headed out, and it was nearly noon when I got back. And that didn't really seem to make much sense. Jean Robinson, abducted twice in childhood. I didn't feel anything. I was like, and like I, you're just like time stops. Cindy Doherty, abducted with her mother, Judy, in 1973. And at that point, the events are blank. Jesse Long, abducted several times since 1956. Under hypnosis, we seem to find the only tool we have of getting at what is a genuine period of missing time. In recent years, hypnosis has gained wider acceptance as a reliable method to enhance memory of past events. Even police departments have used the method to help witnesses remember details of crimes. John Carpenter is a psychiatric hypnotherapist from Springfield, Missouri, who's worked with over 50 people who claim they were abducted by aliens. So they're not fantasizing or creating these stories, but they're very real people who are telling me the same, almost boring details. And over and over again, we get these hidden consistencies in 
uh, abduction reports which come out through hypnosis, and they match exactly the kinds of things that come out under normal recall. And I don't remember stopping, I don't remember pulling over and, and parking the car, but it was inside the halfway in the road and halfway not. And this is when I saw this, the spotlight then was doing this like a beam. But once the beam of light hit me, I was paralyzed. And at that moment, that's when I was on the craft. The description of the UFO occupants are extremely similar. They were about three feet tall. Maybe this high. They, their skin looked like it was made of marshmallow. White, pale color. And they had real big eyes, large, dark eyes. They had real large, claw-like hands. So I couldn't tell if they were mittens or what. Just two nostrils or slits for a nose and a slit for a mouth. They didn't walk, they like glided. The bottom part of their legs kind of like almost robotic. The person will describe being on a table, which is generally metallic. Uh, they uh, are unable to move. And the beings were standing around me. Looking at me. Examining my body. Now when they're on the table, they describe operations which take place. The next thing I remember, they have this thing in front of my eye like a metal instrument that was kind of like shaped like an L and stuck it it went all the way back down to here though in my throat as proof the operations have taken place those who believe they were abducted often point to unexplainable scars even implants my mother remembers me uh, pointing out that I had a scar on my leg um, she said it never bled the scar appeared simultaneously with Jesse's abduction experience at age four in 1956. Beneath the scar, Jesse could always feel a small object. Well, it was in my leg for 34 years, and I finally decided to have it removed. And this is what they took out. Though tests have revealed the object is made of silicone and trace metals, they don't answer where it came from. If it is an alien implant, one theory is that it might be a tracking device similar to those used in tagging operations for birds and other wildlife. We're looking at something which is more like what we do with wildlife. It's, it seems scientific, it seems research-oriented. It seems like there's a real important purpose behind it and not to interfere or destroy us. But in terms, we have something that perhaps they need and perhaps they're helping us in some way. In addition to the consistent and compelling nature of these abduction accounts, it's the conviction behind the stories that has impressed Dr. John Mack, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. What is persuasive to me is that these individuals report this experience uh, as real. It is not dream, it is not fantasy, it is uh, not delusion in my judgment. I've had every psychological test they have and they all came out just fine. Inevitably, all this anecdotal evidence invited the question, why do abductions happen? The answer could be that we're part of a grand intergalactic biological experiment. Some people hypothesize that their uh, planet or where they come from is, is arid and barren and they've lost their own reproductive capabilities, so they are trying to find a new genetic stock uh, with us. Perhaps we're looking at some survival process where Part of our makeup is strengthening their makeup. There is very powerful evidence, and this sounds crazy, but it's true that they are trying to achieve some kind of blend or mix. It's almost as if the missing link is knocking at our back door. The stories are hard to believe. However, people who live thousands of miles apart and have never been in contact with each other have described their ordeals with striking similarity, and reported incidents of abduction are on the rise. But no government authorities have come forward to corroborate the information. After this break, we'll look into what governments all over the world know about UFOs and why they've classified their information beyond top secret. And people are more afraid of our government than they are of organized crime. Since the first UFO sightings in 1947, our government has willingly told us two things about flying saucers. A, they don't exist. And B, no government agency has any more information about the subject than has already been made public. But UFO investigators charge that documents in their possession prove that the military and the government since the end of World War II have orchestrated a constant and effective campaign of disinformation concerning UFOs. Our government 
has flat out lied to us for 40 years or more. They've threatened people and intimidated people. They've spied on UFO groups, infiltrated UFO groups, spied on researchers, compiled dossiers. Their response is bordered on paranoia. In 1988, reporter George Knapp of Las Vegas CBS television station KLAS began investigating the U.S. government's involvement with UFOs. He says he's found evidence proving a massive cover-up that began in 1947 and continues to this day. The CIA says that it does not collect information on UFOs, and it hasn't since the 50s. There are reams of documents squeezed out of the CIA that indicate that they have on staff CIA UFO experts, agency personnel monitoring the situation on an ongoing basis. The FBI denied having any documents on UFOs in the 1970s, the early 1970s. Three years later, they released 1,700 pages of information on UFOs, documents that they had. They lie. But for UFO researchers, there is one persistent problem with those hundreds of released pages. Most, like this 1958 UFO memo to President Eisenhower, have been highly censored, essentially making them unreadable. Even this National Security Agency document explaining why UFO data should remain secret is itself almost entirely blacked out. Ironically, the official position of the U.S. government is that UFOs are not a threat to national security. Yet the agencies involved claim the censored information is vital to national security. From 1947 to 1969, the Air Force conducted Project Blue Book. Staffed with just three people, it studied 12,000 UFO sightings. All but 701 were explained to the military satisfaction. And the group that remained unexplained? It does not contain any pattern of purpose or of consistency that we can relate with any, to any conceivable threat to the United States. The Air Force closed Blue Book in 1969, but project critics weren't satisfied. The first person to head it up, Captain Edward J. Repelt, quit in disgust, wrote his own book and declared that there was something to UFOs, and the Project Blue Book was nothing more than a whitewash. The United States government has spent a lot of time and effort debunking UFOs, even to the point of turning the whole thing into a joke. Of all the items in our stock catalog, there is only one which would have the high velocity and low wind resistance of flying saucers. The cover of a GI trash can. But some military people, like retired Marine Major Donald Keogh, spoke out, accusing the government of hiding what it knows about UFOs. This is not an attack on the Air Force spokesman or the project spokesman. They are simply following orders to explain away all UFO sightings as quickly as possible when they become public and deny that UFOs really exist. We have not been hiding anything. The investigations have been made public. The explanations of those where there is a clear explanation have been made public. What the Air Force hadn't made public was that its pilots had been reporting UFO contacts since World War II. The Air Force was so concerned that in 1953, it even sent its own planes on a mission to seek out and photograph flying saucers. Guy Kirkwood was one of the flyers. After 19 days in the air, he and his fighter group spotted 16 objects two miles to the west. They broke rank and just started moving uh, all over. They were below us, they were above us, they were out in front of us, and accelerating, literally at lightning speed. And a dot in the distance, maybe several miles away from you at that point, maybe a pencil point, all of a sudden closing on you at the rate of several thousand miles an hour, and a 36-foot object, which is basically almost the same size as our aircraft, a 36-foot wingspan. But all of a sudden, this thing is just closing on you faster than you're able to think. After two more encounters with smaller groups of disks, the Air Force called off the mission because of the physical effects on the flight crews. Kirkwood went on to become a commercial pilot, and later he began to talk about his UFO encounters. That quickly earned him a visit from two government agents who told him to stop. And they said, well, the government doesn't like the information being released, and to continue could be detrimental to your health. Kirkwood says the pilots shot thousands of feet of film of UFOs. That film has never been made public. 
Other government officials, including a senator and two men who became president, have tried unsuccessfully to shed some light on the UFO phenomenon. Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater, President Gerald Ford, and President Jimmy Carter, who actually saw a UFO himself and filed a formal report, have all sought to have top secret UFO information released to the public. All requests for that information were denied. Cover-up allegations aren't limited to the United States government either. Author Timothy Good claims that governments around the world are keeping UFO information top secret. And in his book, Above Top Secret, he claims only an elite few have access to that information. I would like to emphasize that very few people in governments have the faintest idea what's happening. Because so little of the research is made known to top ministers. One country is bucking that trend. Belgium has acknowledged tracking unidentified, seemingly intelligently controlled craft in its airspace. Radar tapes released by the Air Force show an object jumping from 200 meters to 2,000 meters in one second, a distance of just over a mile. The Belgian Air Force has even put aside a plane to search for the objects. But the attitude of the United States remains very different. UFO experts claim our government is conducting top secret research into UFOs in the middle of the Nevada desert. South of a dry lake bed known as Area 51 is a place known as S-4, allegedly home to a super secret government research facility. In the course of our investigation, we found a scientist who says he used to work there. Robert Lazar was shocked when he first discovered what it was he would be working on. I got out of the bus, I was told to walk directly through the hangar, and uh, immediately, uh, even before entering the hangar, you can see the edge of a disc. Uh, this is your classic flying saucer, two inverted pie plates, if you wish, uh, with a segmented larger area dome on top. Within minutes of that, I finally realized that this had nothing to do with something the government was producing. And that was quite shocking because everything inside was small. This is a full-size craft, 30, 35 feet in diameter, maybe 40. Uh, but you're looking at, at uh, seats that are, you know, 18 inches off the ground, obviously made, you know, for, for something smaller. And certainly it wasn't made for children to play in. Lazar says there were nine spaceships in all and he claims to have seen one fly. It began to lift off the ground almost silently. There was a hiss sound, uh, like a corona discharge, if you hear around high voltage systems, uh, accompanied by a faint, it probably wouldn't have been brighter at, at night, a faint uh, blue glow around the bottom as the craft approached about 30 feet, 20 feet, something like that off the ground. Uh, that corona discharge disappeared. Uh, the sound stopped and the craft stood there silently and uh, slowly drifted over to the left and then to the right. The government denies they're testing alien craft at S-4. Lazar no longer works there and nowadays spends his time working on one of his hobbies, jet car racing. He alleges that after he went public, security officers at the base threatened his life. He also says that his employment and military service records have disappeared. Despite repeated requests, the government can't find them. The subcontractor who hired him for the job at S-4 refuses to comment. But a few clues support Lazar's contention that he is a scientist and that he has worked for the government. This W-2 form indicates that he had been employed by the Department of Naval Intelligence. Before his stint at S-4, Lazar claims to have worked at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Los Alamos officials can't find any record of him. But his name does appear in a laboratory phone book from that time. Reporter George Knapp was able to track down a few of Lazar's colleagues who could confirm parts of his story. But when they talked to Knapp, something strange happened. One after another had, had visits from, from government personnel who basically intimidated or told them to back off, followed them around. There didn't have to be any direct communication where an agent says, you keep talking to this guy, you're going to end up in a river. The message was very clear. Since Lazar's story broke, Area 51 has become a hotbed for UFO sightings. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Are you seeing this thing zip back and forth, or is it just... You see that? It just zipped to the left. See it again? While our cameras were there, a bright light appeared in the night sky. No, 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 no. Utterly silent, it seemed to float below the mountaintops. Analysis of our videotape proved inconclusive. 
those who might know the answers aren't talking. I've been covering organized crime in Las Vegas for, for 10 years, dealing with uh, mob hitmen and mob informants, uh, people who have been in the witness protection program. The fear that is generated by this UFO subject for people who really know about it far outweighs the kind of fear that the mob inspires. I mean, people are more afraid of our government than they are of organized crime. I am exactly sure of what I saw. I know what mainstream science is like. I know what, where physics stands. I know all of that. And this is an extraterrestrial craft. This technology is hundreds and hundreds of years in advance of us. And that's the end of that story. from dozens of people who describe their encounters with UFOs and aliens. Well, if it's all true, skeptics wonder why aliens haven't landed on the White House lawn. Believers claim that they just might. UFO advocates have put forward one engaging theory. It states that we are being methodically conditioned for the eventual revelation that alien life forms do exist. More official UFO information has surfaced through the Freedom of Information Act. More people are willing to talk and when the day finally comes and the facts are made public, the shock to our collective system would be minimal. But then, it's only a theory. For the UFO Report, I'm Tim White. Good night. Tomorrow night. In 1993, a businessman traveling through San Francisco was approached by a young woman at his hotel bar. He had no way of knowing that he was about to become the latest victim of a clever con called the most significant UFO sightings in years. Hey, there's two of them. See them? Uh-uh. There's one shooting that Too way. Many. It's hauling. Look, Jose, look at that way. See it going? What has UFO experts excited is not just the high quality of the videotape, but that these sightings took place just a few weeks ago. My brother and sister called me. It was about quarter to two. They told me to come out here that there were objects in the sky, flying saucers, UFOs. Jose Escamilla took these pictures on March 5th. That's when he says he looked up in the sky and saw several bright objects hovering overhead. His seven-year-old nephew, Corey, saw them too. I seen some at my house, too, like going in circles. Look how fast it's moving. Oh, wow, look at that. Look closely, not a cloud in the sky, but one of the objects leaves a vapor trail. The central part of the vortex just kept going higher and higher and higher and higher. It's going straight up to it. Wow. Jose says the strange objects hovered overhead for 16 minutes. Then, just as suddenly as they first appeared, they vanished. Where is it now? It's gone. The shots are gone, isn't it? But the UFOs weren't gone for good. They've appeared nearly every day since, and perhaps it's not surprising. The Escamillas live near Roswell, New Mexico, site of the most famous UFO encounter in history. In 1947, near Walker Air Force Base, residents claimed a flying saucer crashed into a field. But within hours, the evidence was gone, reportedly taken by military officials. The US government denies the incident ever happened. But these new sightings over Roswell are interesting, not just because of where they take place, but because these are some of the most compelling images of UFOs ever recorded. Don Ecker has been studying UFOs for years. There are several sequences that appear extremely extraordinary. They have demonstrated flight characteristics that we do not normally associate with our normal everyday aircraft that we can identify. Many of these UFOs appear to travel at breakneck speed, so fast that they're barely detectable by the naked eye. But in slow motion, it's an entirely different story. Here it comes, flying in a uh, lateral, and now it's turning up almost uh, 45 degrees. Now it will flip on its side. Yes, there it goes. Once again, level out and leave the screen. Now, that would be very tough to, uh, to explain. But could this be a hoax, a video trick? We had the tapes analyzed and could find no evidence the pictures had been doctored. During the course of this investigation and analysis, I have seen absolutely nothing that would suggest any hoaxing whatsoever. Perhaps there's another explanation. With a former U.S. air base nearby, some suggest what the Escamillas have seen is nothing more than the Pentagon testing secret aircraft. There have always been a preponderance of sightings in areas where there's a lot of military activity, and this has been uh, 
almost a historical imperative. Hard copy also took the footage to a video engineer. Using the latest digital technology, Jerry Saavedra enhanced several frames, searching for details that might be lost by the limited resolution of ordinary cameras. There are two in the frame, as you can see, one here that is much further away, and um, this one here, which is, is quite close, actually, and you can actually see it's uh, definitely three-dimensional. It appears to me to be diamond-shaped. The features are striking, seemingly beyond the realm of conventional aircraft. It has no vertical stabilizer, no wings that uh, are apparent, and it does match other objects, uh, other photographs of UFOs that I've seen. As for the Escamillas, they continue to watch the skies, taping UFOs. They know something's there. They just don't know for sure what it is, or when, if ever, the mystery will be solved. With these latest UFO sightings, local residents are lobbying the federal government to open their files on the Roswell. There's uncovers provocative new evidence. We're dealing with a cosmic water gate. From New York, reporter Sandra Pinkney investigates an alleged UFO crash that the government won't talk about. I know that I saw a night turn into daylight. Could this startling footage be proof? It's a very advanced uh, government project, or an exotic spacecraft. From Canada, Russell Rhodes hunts for the mystery man behind these revealing images. Could you talk to Please. me about the to. UFOs? Is Guardian really the deep throat of UFO conspiracies? The area seems to be a hotbed. And from Puerto Rico, Natalie Brunt uncovers reports of mysterious underground activities. People have seen actual UFOs, flying saucer, whatever going into the lagoon or coming out from the lagoon.